He was looking at the things happening in life and he knows what he's bringing to the world. And he says, man, I wish this was already happening. It's so needed. Because the godless do whatever they want. It seems. And get away with it. You know, our world has never been able to countenance or approve or tolerate this fire that we're talking about. You know, the world, though, loves lukewarm and compromised Christians. He has no problem with us. In fact, you make people feel good if you're lukewarm and compromised. They actually feel kind of blessed to be around you. Blessed in their own, you know, sinners even use the word blessed. And if you're, if you're hearing this and thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to be obnoxious, I'm going to preach out everybody. No, no, please, find your balance here. Know what, I'm trying to stay with what the scripture is teaching, you know. Yeah, everybody hates me because uh, I've just said, uh, no, they hate you because maybe you're stupid. That's why. <laughs> you always have to bring that balance. But the, the truth is still the truth. Our world has never been able to countenance God's fire and zeal. Couldn't handle it in Jesus, and it's not going to handle it in you either. So many Christians, because of this, they back off. And they never have this fire of conviction in their life. And they're never divisive. And they and they just kind of collapse into this thing. I'm just going to kind of be a passive Christian. You know, back in the 90s, many Bible churches started offering what they called seeker-sensitive services. By and large, this was what you would call a megachurch phenomenon. But it was built upon the, the, uh, a very important theological narrative shift, and that is downplay anything divisive or controversial. Let me tell you something this morning. Truth is controversial. Come on, always has been, always will be. We live in a fallen world that has a hard time with truth. Come on. And so it's always going to, well, you know, it's just, I don't want to make anybody, listen, you're going to make somebody uncomfortable at some point if you're, if you're a person of truth. Amen. But in the 90s, many churches thought, you know what, people are not coming to church as much, and so we're going to kind of shift the, narr uh, the theological narrative uh, of our church, uh, we're going to downplay anything divisive uh, and difficult to, for them, uh, and so, you know, we're going to emphasize more appealing qualities, uh, uh, you know, like uh, God loves you, and God wants to bless you, and God wants to help you, and you're going to be the greatest here, and because uh, God just cares so much about you. But never talk about sin. Never talk about those things uh, that separate people from God for eternity. They call them seeker sensitive. In other words, they don't like this verse too much about Jesus saying, I've come to bring division. Jesus said these words, though, we need to pay attention. How many remember his woes? Remember the woe, woe this, woe this, woe this, woe. You ought to listen to it. When Jesus says woe about something, you better pay attention. But one of the things he said is, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. If you're a false prophet in this world, you got a big following. you got a lot of popularity. If you're a false prophet, 2 Peter says the same thing in chapter 2. Jesus said, woe unto you when all men are speaking well of you. Because you're not there to, to bring the division God wants. Uh, you're there for your own purposes. For so did their fathers, uh, Jesus says, to the false prophets. Now, listen, every one of us wants to be liked. I hope you want to be liked. That means, you know, that means, you know, we don't need to set you down on the couch with a psychiatrist. I hope you want to be liked. We all want to be liked. And we all want to be approved. This is part of our nature that is normal. But listen to me, this is very important. God's people are people who their foremost desire is God's approval. Thank God for people who care about you and love you and approve of you. But our first aim is to get God's approval. Amen. You know, in this scripture, the Matthew 10 uh, uh, rendition of this verse 
uh, uh, Jesus is actually talking about the, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father as he's beginning to challenge them about this division. Let me move on as I close and talk about how when this division gets personal, when it gets personal, it's one thing to be shunned or to be disrespected or, or uh, removed from just whatever people on your job or in school or whatever, but it's quite another when it becomes family, when it's family. And um, this is what Jesus is saying here in verse 52. Luke chapter 12, verse 52. For from now on, five in one house will be divided. Three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father and mother against daughter and daughter against mother and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. As I'm reading that, I'm thinking in my mind, you don't need God for all that to be happening. A lot of people are happening. But, I want you to think of it in the context of Jesus saying to the Christians, people who are following Him, who want the Holy Spirit, who want to be on fire, that there was going to be a division even reaching out, even in the, the families. Remember who He's talking to. He's talking to the Jews. The Jews were radically family-oriented people. In fact, their whole society was built on it. Just do a quick survey of the Old Testament and how important lineage was to them and tribe and family and, and patriarchs and all of that. I mean, he's talking to people that their whole lives were about this uh, and yet he's coming and telling them uh, with the fire that I'm bringing, there's going to be a separation even in the family. They literally used to be, they were literally people who fought to the death to preserve their families and their family structure. But Jesus is saying something very important here by this division that there is a higher, if I can use the word fraternity, than blood family. And that's the family of God. Well, Remember the story when Jesus is teaching and he's interrupted by, by someone who comes to him and says, hey, Jesus, Jesus, so, um, your mother and your brothers are outside <coughs> and want to talk to you. Now, this is interesting because his mothers and his brother, or his mothers, his one mother, his mother and his brothers uh, didn't go inside to see, to, to be part of what he was doing. They were outside. And if you know the story of Jesus, his mother had doubts about him. The same one who bore him supernaturally was having doubts about his ministry. His brothers didn't believe on him. John chapter 7. And so they're outside, and, and, and he gets this message, and they want to talk to you. Some Bible commentators were thinking, we're, we're trying to rescue him from himself. Because he thinks he's all that. But remember what Jesus said. He said, here, he's talking about those who are listening to him and receiving his ministry. He said, here's my brother's and my mother. And all those who hear and do the will of God are my mother and my brother. And so in that one, that, you know, that one story uh, 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 encompasses so much to understand what he's trying to tell us here. From the very beginning, it was apparent that families go in different directions. First two brothers, what happened? Cain and Abel. One got approved by the Lord. The other one wasn't happy he wasn't. Killed the brother, you know the story. You know Joseph, when God began to move on him and he had the anointing on him and, and the dreams and all that God was going to use him, his brothers, what? Began to persecute him. In many Orthodox traditional families today, there is actually great conflict and difficulty when somebody commits their life to Jesus. Come on. You know, in Islamic homes, depending on how uh, devout they are, man, they take this thing very seriously. 
even the threat of life itself. Orthodox Jewish homes, they hear things like, uh, uh, you are dead to me now. I mean, these are it's very real. They, if you look at the scripture we're looking at this morning to one of them, they'll understand immediately what this means. A sad thing, but it's, it happens. Sometimes there are a few things in life that sting more than family rejection. It's one thing for the world at large to reject you or whatever. There's family that stings a lot more. And that's why Jesus is saying what he's saying. I remember when my brother got saved. We didn't grow up in a Christian home, as many of you know. You know, we were traditional Catholics, and we weren't into it. We were just a very secular home, to say the least. Both my parents were uh, educators, teachers, and, and so, you know, the, the topic of God wasn't a big one in my home at all. But um, my brother was, I believe, 19. My older brother, Ray, he gave his life to Jesus. And he really did. He really started going to church and started changing. I had doubts about him at first. I said, yeah, let's see how long this phase lasts in your life. But, uh, and then, you know, uh, I remember him, he cut his hair and he's wearing sandals. She never, and I go, okay, something's going on. Just, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, he, he, you know, he was really trying to follow Jesus and quit. You know, and in our world, that means you quit partying. That was a big thing. I mean, there wasn't too much else to our lives at that time. Partying. 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 You ever hear about that stuff happening? I don't know. Two sides. Uh, anyway, he wouldn't party with us anymore. You know? And so we were convicted of partying around him. And so what did that mean? That meant. When we were partying and he showed up, it, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't comfortable. Right? It was kind of awkward. Come on. And then we'd get quiet because, you know, what else are you talking about? You know? And so it was just, it was so my point is, is that it was very difficult for him. Just the normal brother relations that we had before. For, and he talks about this in his testimony, and he'll tell you that there were times when it was so intense, even though he didn't let on, that he went and wept by himself because he could he was trying to follow God and yet is hurt. Is that the vision would be like a, we weren't spewing terrible things and we were just we were like in two different worlds. And he knew the difference. <coughs> Let me just say, if you're the only one in your family living for Jesus. Or the first one in your family be saved, I'm going to tell you, man, you're a hero for God. Amen. Come on. You are a hero for God because you are breaking through and God knows what you're going through. Come on. It's different. You know, when I got saved, all my brothers got saved around the same. My other brothers got saved around the same. So, you know, it was pretty easy in that respect for me. But it's not that way for a lot of people. Maybe you're the only one on your job or the only one in your school or the only one in your family that's never forgotten. Let me tell you, God takes great notice of that. Right. And let me tell you something. You were also a candidate for great anointing and fire because of it. Let me just close by one simple truth here to stop. And that is that Jesus is reminding us something very important as we end this portion of scripture in verse 54. He turns to the multitudes as he's teaching this very important truth. He turns to the multitudes and he says, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Now, he's just said all those hard things that I just mentioned. Now he turns to the crowd and he begins to rebuke them. He says, 
you're able to see the clouds and, and come to the right conclusion, man, I know what the weather's going to be like. I can plan my life. I can make decisions based on this awareness that I have of things. Uh, and I can, uh, I can do all these things in life where I'm able to draw these right conclusions uh, and, and live my life the way I should. But somehow, when it comes to spiritual things, uh, you can't discern. Jesus said, I'm in front of you and you can't discern who I am and what I'm doing. Uh, and he's rebuking them. Because human nature is stubborn. Come on. He's, this isn't for the Pharisees or the Sadducees or these religious people that, that were his opponents. No, this is for the multitudes. In other words, that people are so easily, uh, amen, just to, uh, 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 you know, separate themselves from, from the truth that I'm talking about. I get, yeah, I don't want to hear it. Or, I don't understand. Or, or, you know, no, I think that's what you're doing. <clears throat> Let me just say this. People know what right and wrong is. And when there's a, convic a conviction because somebody of the Holy Spirit of the Word of God is in their presence, uh, they know. Come on. They know. You didn't have to convince me I was a sinner. It's been, I, I may have given you 15 arguments about why you should go off in that direction or this direction as we talk about God, but uh, there was no doubt I knew who I was in my heart. Come on. And that's why Jesus ends with this. And he's basically saying, as I close, everybody's going to be held accountable. This is some secret information that you've got and you're more spiritually inclined and that's why you're in church and other people aren't. No, 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 that's, that's not true. The Bible says God has given everybody a measure of faith. The truth is the truth. We were born with this capacity. And Jesus says that he is holding everybody accountable. He says, uh, you better make sure what you're doing is right because uh, if you're wrong, you're going to pay the highest price. And our place to love is God's people is to say, God, I want the fire. I don't want to run from the fire. I want the fire. I want to be on fire for you because more than ever, it's a generation that needs this kind of fire. Let's bow our heads.